We're in Acts chapter 17, so why don't you guys go ahead and turn your Bibles. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 34, but I'm going to read verses 1, um, 16 all the way down to verse 21, and then I'm going to stop and begin my study. So I would really appreciate if you guys can do me a favor, and can you stand as we read the scriptures um, to give reverence to the Word of God, and then we'll begin our study. Beginning in verse 16, Luke records for us this portion of Paul's story in which he is doing a work for the Lord. And there's some things that I want to highlight here. And, my, and what I want to do today is just encourage you to stand firm, especially in times like this, where now Christians have been targeted. We've been targeted. We, you know, people are now are starting to hate us. Have you guys noticed that? They're starting to burn down and they're trying to, you know, keep us from worship, keeping, keeping us from doing all kinds of things that we were doing prior to this whole, you know, quarantine. And I just want to be an encouragement to you today. So hopefully you guys will allow me into your hearts as I share with you from the Word of God. Beginning in verse 16, this is what Luke records. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. When he saw that the city was given over to idols, therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers. And in the marketplace, daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and said, What, what does this babbler want? What, what, what does babbler want to want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. I, I can't pronounce the word, so let's just call it the swap meet, right? <laughs> Saying, may we, now, uh, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. And Father, we pray as we get into your word that you will speak to our hearts. Convict those that need to be convicted. Comfort those that need to be comforted. Strengthen those that are weakened, Lord. Father, what we're asking of you is that you will meet every single one of us exactly where we're at. So that when we leave these doors, our hearts may be renewed. A fire may, 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 may burn within us, Lord, for us to continue being faithful until you call us home. God, help us to stand firm in these days. In Jesus' name we say, amen. You may have a seat. So as I mentioned, we are living in some hard times today where our faith is being pretty much unapologetically challenged. Our faith is questioned. Our faith is mocked. As your fellow, fellow brother in Christ, as I mentioned, I want to encourage you guys to stand firm and not to back down from these attacks on our faith. In fact, we know as we study scripture, this attack has been going on since the beginning of time. And it will continue until God calls us home. Jesus said, made, he made it really clear that in this world you will have tribulation. And then he tells us not to worry, right? Because he has overcome the world. But we do know that these attacks are going to come. Our faith is going to be challenged. The question is this, will you stand firm? Well, I want to encourage you to be faithful to the end. Not to fold, but to stand bold. To raise our flag of faith, expecting others to salute it. Or expecting others to believe in our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. In this part of scripture, listen closely. We'll see how Paul had to stand firm in a pagan world. Paul at this time is in a great city. The city of Athens. The intellectual and the cultural center of the ancient world. And he's waiting for two of his, of his main uh, helpers. Which is Silas and Timothy who are at this time in Berea. Paul had went ahead of them, um, um, and he's there in Athens. As, and as he's waiting, he's walking the road, the streets of this, this ancient city in Athens. Now listen, as he's waiting to be joined by his other um, partners, he finds himself alone in this big city. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. He is alone in this city where there's so many people, so much thing is going on in that city. And one of the things that I do want to ask is this. Have you ever been alone in a big city? Well, the reality is, is that whenever we are alone anywhere, 
our character will be tested. It's been said, listen closely, that the test of your character is what you do when you're alone in the big city. You hear me? You will be tested. When no one's watching, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, and everyone else is at work or at school, whether you're at school, by yourself, or wherever you might be, listen, that's where it shows where you stand with God. Will you be standing firm or will you be compromising? Will you, be, will you remain faithful or will you be um, kind of punking out on the things of God? See, the reality is that it is when we are alone that our true colors will show before God. How I pray that whenever we are alone, that our character may, may, may stay the same. And that is one of integrity and holiness and godliness. So... The only way to remain firm, the only way to keep that character is very simple. You know what it is? Being totally sprung up on Jesus. That means totally in love with Christ. Because when you're in love with Christ, and, and when I ask that question, I really want you guys to think about it. Do you really love Jesus with all your heart and soul? Because when you are in love with Christ, when you are in love with him, Literally, that's all you can think about. That's all you want to talk to. That's all you want to spend your time with. I tell you this, after you're experiencing that, that blessings that come in, in our relationship with Him, when you experience the goodness of God through, 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 through His presence in our lives, huh, you will fall deeper and deeper and deeper in love. So when temptation comes, or, or the temptation to compromise comes, your love for the Lord is what will keep you faithful wherever you're at, whether you're in a, uh, with a group of people or whether you are alone. But I want you to know that as Paul walked the streets of Athens, his spirit was stirred up, as we just read, within him. And the reason why is because he saw in this city the depth or the depravity or the wickedness that, that, that haunted this city. As he walked through Athens, he saw false teachers. Someone said, peddling soul dope, uncle. He, he, he passed through pagan temples filled with empty people. Idols surrounded him. In fact, this city was filled with cynicism, which simply speaks of skepticism or doubt or distrust, suspicious and disbelief. Athens, in fact, was the cultural center of this ancient world, and, 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 it, and it had its beauty. It, it was, it, it was, it had, when you were to visit Athens, I've seen pictures, but, you know, the ruins, <laughs> but, but I can only imagine the buildings and everything that was going on. It, it was no doubt, you know, shocking, incredible uh, beauty. And he's there in that city and he sees all these things going on. In fact, as I mentioned, this city was the cultural center of the ancient world and it had an overwhelming glory. So when Paul came in there, he looked up to the mountain, which is called uh, Acro Acropolis. I think I pronounced it right. Sitting at the top there was, was the Parthenon, which was dedicated to the sex goddess, Athene. Athens was also an intellectual center of the world, of the ancient world. Art, literature, philosophy is what made ancient Athens. It was actually the, the native home of Socrates and Plato. Names spoken of with reverence in the philosophy realm. It also became the adopted home of Aristotle and Epicus and Zeno, who were there as a result of this cultural superiority and intellectualism. This was a city, no doubt filled with uh, um, snobbery, debate, lots of pride. And Paul was there, and he's about to meet some strong resistance as he will share about Jesus Christ. Now, why do I say all this thing? Because I want you to know that we live in a place today, America, where we find all these things today here. And my encouragement to you is to, to that when your faith is challenged, when your faith is questioned, you may be able to answer them accordingly, that you will not back down, but that you will stand firm and allow God to speak to them through you as you endure the persecution, as you endure the mockeries, as you endure whatever the enemy throws at you. 
Because the reality is, listen, if we're standing firm and, and we're committed or dedicated to the purpose, which is to, to preach the gospel to the lost, I'm telling you this, man, faithfulness is what allow you to do so. But again, here he is in this beautiful city, just like America. And now we see him standing. Now, I want to give you a few things if you're taking notes. First, I want you to know that we will experience challenges to our faith like Paul. You need to understand that things are not going to be easy for us believers. You, 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 you don't just become a Christian and you put it on cruise control. You hear me? You don't just go on cruise control. If you are a child of God and you're living out your life in obedience to his word, oh, trust me, you will get challenged. You will get challenged. But I want you to know there's no such thing of cruise control. There's no shortcuts. We have to be engaged with God's purpose in our lives. And he has revealed to us his will, right? To preach the gospel, to make disciples. Well, are you doing it today? But Paul experienced three challenges that I want to point at you right now. Number one, the apostle Paul faced superstitious idolatry. Notice what it says in verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that city was given over to idols. In verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of uh, Arepagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. The, new, the King James Version uses the word superstitious, not religion. So there were idols or pagans, images everywhere that Paul looked. And the people of Athens... Actually, if you're taking notes, this is something to jot down, had approximately over 30,000 different gods or idols that they worship. You're probably saying, I thought you said that that day would be like ours when I said like Athens was like America. We don't have 30,000 different gods, but I want you to know something. We have more. You see, our cities is filled with idolatry. And the difference is that we give our idols different names. And I'm going to give you guys the difference here. I'm going to share the, the, the old times, you know, names that they gave their idols. And we're going to see how they, they mix with the idols that we have today. So, again, we're living in a place where idolatry is the sin that dominates. Now, what is an idol? What is an idol? Well, an idol is anything we love more. An, an idol is anything we fear more, anything that we serve more or trust more than God. It's anything that is first place in our lives. Whatever your heart clings to or trusts, that is your idol. That is an idol. I want you to know that idolatry is the greatest sin. You hear me? It's the greatest sin that a man can commit. Why? Because in Matthew 22, verse 37... Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, we know that Jesus doesn't exaggerate, right? He doesn't give us these commands and then says, well, you know what? I just sounded good, so I'm just going to tell you, love me with everything you got. When he tells us that we are to love God with all our being, that's what God expects from us. And how do we get there? <laughs> That's something that you and God need to talk. But I know in my life, my love for the Lord developed as I saw his faithfulness upon my life. As I constantly visited the cross, opening up the scriptures and reading when Jesus was there on the cross, dying for my sins. Appreciating what he did. What he did for someone that does not deserve his grace and his mercy. But yet, he still did it for me. And for you. But again, the question I put to you today, are you loving God with everything? Or is there other things in your life? Maybe a husband. Maybe a wife, kids, family. Didn't Jesus say that you are to prefer him over anything else? Maybe a job, sports. How many people are not coming to church even today? Not so much because of what's going on, but because the Dodgers are playing the Astros. You know what I'm saying? And they're watching the game here and they're watching the message here. 
think about it. If you really love God the way he tells us, we will have a healthy relationship with the Lord. We will walk in obedience. We will walk with the purpose of bringing him glory and honor. Do you love God with all that is in you? Ask yourself that question. Jesus says, if you love me, think about that. If you love me, if you really love me, what does he say? Keep my commandments. Is that simple? You don't have to try to complicate. You don't need a theologian to break it down for you. Hey, if you love me, show me. If you love me, obey me. It's that simple. And one of the things that I've learned in my walk with God, that because he loves me, the things that he gives to me is for my own good, for his glory, but my good. Just like when you tell your kids because you love them. Don't be on your phone too much. It's going to mess you up. You're not telling them because you're trying to spoil their phone. You're telling them because you love them and you know the effects of being on a cell phone too long or eating candy when they're little. Don't eat all that candy. Don't eat all those, that, that chocolate. You're telling, you're giving them these commands because you love them. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Well, there was this superstitious idolatry in Athens. There was all these people that love, <laughs> that love things more than the one who gave them these things. But like I said, we might have just as many idols here in America, if not more, idols in our society today that we'll face, we'll just, <laughs> that we face, we, what we do is we actually just change their name, as I said I was going to do. Now let me give you some of the, the names. For instance, here are some of the modern gods that have old names. The god of materialism. That's the, uh, they call this God Manum, Mammon. In this city, we have those that worship the God of Mammon. These are those that their lives are devoted to wealth, business, success, achievements, and so forth. And we need to be honest with ourselves. Even when I ask you, do you really love God? And if you do, you say you do, does business pull your heart? Family, success, wealth. Achievements. Because the reality is this. The one you spend the time with the most. That's the one you love. So we need to be honest. We need to be honest with ourselves. And know that we may check ourselves. You know. For a long time I lived. Not being honest to myself. I thought that all my bad was my wife's fault. <laughs> I did. And it wasn't until that day when God was really tugging at my heart because I would blame everybody around me. And I remember one day I went outside of my house. It was late night, evening, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I told God because I was dealing with anger. And I told God, God, please deliver me. Please deliver me. Please, please. All the way into the morning. The only reason why I went inside because the kids were going to school and I looked like a bum right outside, you know. But I was praying and asking God, God, please break my heart. Please open my eyes. You know, what is it, Lord? I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being this person. I want to experience true joy and peace within me. Help me, God. Talk to me, please. And for hours, I, there I was begging God. And it's not that God wanted me to beg him. He just wanted me to, he wanted to break me to where there's no more fight in me. And I remember just finally I said, okay, God, please, I'm getting cold out here. God said, David, you need to take responsibility for your own actions. And just that moment I realized, oh, man, I've been the problem. Lord, forgive me. See, you have to be honest with yourselves. If you love other things than God, then tell God, God, I'm sorry, man, I put other things before you. Because the reality is, when we commit idolatry, we're sinning. And the Bible says that, that he who covers his sin shall not prosper. You can't progress. You can't move forward. But when you're honest with yourself and you confess your sin, oh, God will bless you. He'll forgive you, of course. And then you're able to move on. You're able to continue on in your relationship with God as your love deepens in appreciation for what he's done and is doing in your life. But the reality is, <laughs> Who really dominates our heart? Is it 
our achievements, our possessions, or Jesus. This God of manner has heavily influenced many lives, if you think about it. Think of the drug dealers, the pornographers, the liquid industry, liquor industries, uh, with the public officials who betray America's integrity, and the gambling industry. All are influenced by the God of mammon. I pray the church is not influenced by the God of mammon. Then number two, the God of alcohol. The ancient people call this God Bakua. This, is, I probably mispronounced it, it's B-A-C-C-H-U. This is the God of drunkenness, drugs, debauchery. Think about today. Our youth, our young adults, <laughs> even adults. It's all about the party scene. It's all about drinking. All about alcohol. The God of sex. This, this God, they gave this God the name, uh, a name, and, and her name is Venus, Aphrodite, or Athene. This was the sex goddess, the God of sexual lust and pro, uh, promiscuity. And tell me if this is not true, America is like a sex God. We live in a sex-saturated society. society. America is immersed in a, in a swamp of adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and pornography. The God of violence. This was called the God of Mars. This God was called Mars, which was the God of power, strength, and revenge. And today, this God of violence is being worshipped. You're saying, how? Look at some of the video games your children are playing. Grand Theft Auto? Mm -hmm. Think about it. The God of wisdom uh, and, and, and knowledge. The name of, of the, this God is Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. And today, tell me if this is not true, many worship this God of intelligence. And this is what the Apostle Paul was facing in his time. And this is what we Christians are facing in America today. We are facing the God of alcohol, the God of sex, the God of violence, the God of wisdom and knowledge, the God of materialism. This is what we're fighting against. This is what we're, 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 we're called to, to expose because these are the things that are pulling people away from God rather than drawing people to God. And people are falling into a pit of, 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 of sin and pain and regret. Because all these things that I mentioned are instruments that the devil uses to enslave even the Christian. To keep the Christian away from the things that God has for them. And the world from salvation. So, Paul faced these these things in Athens. Anything we love again, fear, trust, and serve more than God is an idol. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you. I mean, do you believe that? Do you really, really believe that? Because if you do, you won't give your time to the things I just mentioned. Because you trust God. When you put him first, he got you, man. He'll take care of you. Don't ignore your family. Don't ignore your spiritual family here at church. You go. I remember when I first got saved, and I was coming here to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. One of the things that I told my wife, my family, and my friends, I said, listen, Wednesdays is for God. Sundays is for God. I fellowship doesn't mean that I'm a part-time Christian in the rest. The other days I live like a devil. No. But I made it really clear, even every job that I would get hired, I'd say, listen, I don't work Sundays and I don't work Wednesdays. And if you want me to work on Wednesdays, as long as I'm out so I can get there at church. Why do you want to go to church? Boy, it's boring. No, because that's something between me and my God. But God must be first in our life. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. An idol is simply, someone wrote, quote, a magnified sinner, unquote. A person, <laughs> a magnified sinner, and I'll just stop there. Here's another thing. Paul faced self-righteous orthodoxy. Notice verse 17. He tells us there. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He faced self-righteous orthodoxy. He's now facing those who believe in the one true God. He's facing those who were, quote, self-satisfied, unquote, and who didn't know Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. These were actually respectable sinners. 
or religious to an extent. These are those that look down on those that are superstitious. But they've never seen themselves in, the need, in need of a Savior like Jesus Christ. But Paul was one at one time, this self-righteous bigot, until he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. And his life was there transformed. Listen. We'll meet many in our cities that may not be open, devout idolaters. But they'll be self-righteous, not seeing their need for a Savior. This is who was before Paul. These are the people that he was talking like in verse 17. These were worshipers. These were people that had a knowledge of the true, of the true living God. But that's all, just knowledge. In verse 18, we see that Paul faced a sophisticated philosophy. These are those that see themselves as intellectual giants. As mentioned, Athens wasn't just a cultural center, but the intellectual center of the world at the time, and philosophers were gathered there in Athens. What does philosophy mean? It simply means a love for knowledge. A love for knowledge, or, or a love of knowledge. So love of knowledge can never satisfy, listen, the deepest longing of the human heart. And Paul is there in Athens and he sees idolatry. He sees orthodoxy in this philosophy. And now Paul will have to face them. Notice in verse 18, Then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encounter him. And some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus Christ and the resurrection. I love the fact that they acknowledge that, look, acknowledge that he was preaching Christ and the resurrection. He was preaching the gospel, man, to these intellectual giants there. These intellectual giants. So he encountered two types of philosophy while in Athens. Philosophy of pleasure. For the note takers, pretty much the, the Epicureans were uh, were simply um, a group of people. And let me give you something about him. Epicurus lived about 300 years before Christ. And he had a philosophy that said that you really can't make sense out of life. And that the search of reason or truth by reason is impossible. He believed that absolute truth would never be found. So he said pretty much, listen, this is all you have. This is all you can do. You can be sure of. So enjoy yourselves. He's saying the wisest thing is pleasure based on your own personal experience. And tell me if this is not what we see today. People that are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Who believe that absolute truth could not be found through reason. Therefore, the wisest thing in their mind is pleasure based upon experience. Think about that for a moment. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. When Paul gives a list of the things that will happen in the last days, one of the things that he says is that people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And we see that today, even before the quarantine, man. Football season came, and for some reason, the church shrank. Oh, no, no reason. We know the reason. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then you have the, the philosophy of, of, of pride, the Stoics. These were uh, led by a philosopher named Zeno, who, who, um, and, and this guy pretty much believed that everything is God and God is everything, and that humanity is self-sufficient. It was a form of intellectual and intelligent pride. And we see those two philosophies in our world today. But listen closely, though. As Paul is walking Athens, he's running into these people. His faith was is challenged. The apostle Paul is going to express his faith with great confidence. He ain't going to shy away. He's not going to back down. Because I'm telling you, man, I, I know a lot of people today, especially with everyone, for some reason, think they're political experts. When our faith is challenged, we don't want no problems, so we're just going to let you be. No, listen, that's not what God wants from us. We have the truth. We are to rise up and speak the truth. Why? Because the truth sets people free. We need to speak the truth with confidence and let God do what he needs to do through us. 
Don't let fear cripple you. Don't let embarrassment keep you from speaking up. Be faithful. Be faithful. So they wanted to hear what Paul, this babbler, had to say, as we just read. They had a place called Mars, uh, a place called Mars Hills, where they would gather to discuss matters. People would just gather around these intellectuals, and they wanted to hear this new belief, whatever belief that came up. They just wanted to talk. They wanted to gather information. They wanted to build their knowledge bank or whatever, right? And there it is in Mars, in Mars Hills. Paul there is standing with the opportunity to share with them. Keep in mind. He was walking the streets of Athens. He's seen all these idols. He's seen the beauty of Athens. He's seen the intellectuals and everything that's going. He's catching all this. And now he has the opportunity. Listen listen to what it says. He said, they're asking him, what does this babbler want to, you know, want to say? They're giving him an opportunity. God has given him the opportunity. What is he going to do? Is he going to shy away or is he going to speak up? Paul has an opportunity to share with them. And now these philosophers want to hear him speak. You can see God's fingerprints on this. In this part of Paul's life. With all the indescribable beauty of Athens around him. And in the shadows of the great philosophers like Plato, Socrates, Zeno, and Epicurus. Paul knew that this human wisdom and beauty of the city was nothing but, quote, magnificent foolishness, unquote, without Christ. If that was us, what would we say? Will we be ready to, for such a moment like Paul to speak the gospel, to preach the gospel with boldness? Or will we be sidetracked by the beautiful buildings? Think about that. Sometimes, let me, let me tell you, there's a guy named Brian McDaniel. He's a missionary to Haiti, man. Dude, if you ever get a chance to go to mission uh, to Haiti with him, do so, man. That guy's crazy. I love hanging out with him, man. You know, but he shared, one of the things that we used to love when we gather in, uh, there with him, you know, in the night when we're just telling stories because the TV don't not working up there, you know, uh, he will always just keep us entertained with the stories that he will share. And, and, and today I called him up and I said, hey, bro, can I share your story, man? He goes, go for it, David. You know, I'll pray for you, bro. And he's praying for me and all that. But he shares a story how he was sent to the Himalayas up in India um, to go and, and, and to see what's going on. Because there was a pastor there in India who was actually supposed to be, had supposed to plant a church and do a work. For 12 years, the, the, the work there was stale. It was dead. It was dying. And he tells me how he heard that this path, that every time missionaries would go over there to kind of help them out in the mission work, uh, what, they would, what this pastor would do is he would take them up there to the, I think he, I forgot how high he said it was, 7,000, you know, whatever. He took them up there where all these, these temples, these Buddhist temples were, and all these statues. And he said they were like 4,000 years old. And he would just kind of show them all off and, and stuff like that. So when he got there with another buddy of his, he said that the pastor said, oh, you got to see these temples. You got to see this place. Man, it's going it's to blow you away, man. Oh, it's so beautiful. And he's looking at him and saying, no wonder this mission work here is dead. This guy's so sidetracked. He's caught up in the beauty of the, of, of the temples and, and, and the history behind these statues. <laughs> and, and my point that I want to make, I'll give him up, but I just want to share this other part of the story. Because he talks about that the guy that he went with, he was training them how to be a missionary. And then, so what he did that later on after they saw these temples and everything, they went down and it bothered him that this pastor was so sidetracked. So he said, man, did you see those idols? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah. He says, man, bro, we should, we should do something. And so he doesn't think much. He finally just says, oh, okay, whatever, right? So he goes to sleep. Then he wakes him up about 3 in the morning while everyone's asleep. He says, come with me. He goes, like, where are you going? He goes, just come with me, come with me. So he takes him up the hill there where all the temples and the idols are. <laughs> and this guy me busting up, man. And he tells this guy, come, come, come. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, I need you to help me. So they put their hands on this statue that's 4,000 years old. And he says, when I say three, push. He goes, what? Are you serious? He goes, this is idolatry, bro. We got to get rid of this stuff. And they push this idol down the hill. And then they ran for their lives. <laughs> but this guy, McDaniel, who was such a character, man. He talks about how this pastor was so sidetracked. How many of us are like that? In the fields that God has called us to serve, we're distracted. 
We're caring about everything else around us. We're, oh, look at that, man, the Staples Center. That's awesome. Oh, look at this. You know, when we should be engaged doing the work of God. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't go watch a Lego game. It's like nothing like this, especially you can't even do that right now anyway. But you know what I'm saying? That we can be so caught up in life, in the worries of life, the cares of this world, we become like that sea that landed in the thorns, remember? Where it says that the cares and the worries choked it and the sea was, cannot bear fruit. There was no fruit there. May God help us not be those. May we just go and be focused on the purpose, on the call. Paul looks at them and, and realizes that they had cover all their bases. And we see that now. No, no, check this out. Let's read now from verses uh, 20, 19 to 21. And they took him and they brought him to this place. I called it a swami. And he says, may we know what this new doctrine is, is of which you speak, they tell Paul. I can imagine Paul, he's all like, oh, man, I'm ready to go. You don't, you don't tell a, a teacher, preacher, man, uh, give him the mic because you know what happens. He says, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean for all the Athenians and the foreigners, uh, and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but, <laughs> but either to tell or to hear new things. So there he is. Paul's getting ready to share. Verses 23 and 23, he covers all the bases. Notice uh, uh, as uh, Paul is observing, he talks to them. Uh, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Eric. You guys want to help me pronounce that? Thank you. See, I knew I can. you guys can do it. And he says, men of Athens, Athens I perceive that in all things you are very religious, for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with the scriptures to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim, proclaim to you. Now, I love Paul. Paul was taking whatever he can see, and he's going to use it for the glory of God. He's using wisdom. He's walking around. He sees all these statues that are you know, erected to dedicate every God you can think of. And just in case they miss one, they made one and dedicated to this unknown God just so that if this unknown God is forgotten, he won't be offended, right? He won't be, you know, uh, look like if he doesn't exist. So just in case we don't, you know, hurt this God, we'll just make one for that God that doesn't even know that he's a God or whatever. He has it all covered. All the bases are covered, these people. He saw these statues that were dedicated to other gods. And then that one to the unknown God. And he used that one to bring to them a message which is recorded from the, verse, the verses down. Notice what Paul said about God. On Mars hills, he preached the one true God in the midst of this pagan society. He said that the God that he speaks of is of God of created power, 24 and 25, notice. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples, notice that, Made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, men's hands, as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He says, God is the God of created power. God made everything, he says, and stands above all distinct from create and is distinct from creation. In America today, we have gone, and I like what one man said, one preacher. He said, America today has gone from Father God to Mother Earth. And we see that today here, where now our God can no longer be worshipped in our schools. But Easter comes, <laughs> Easter Day, right, or Earth Day, let's go worship some dirt. They chose to worship the creation rather than the creator. Sad. He also saw how he talks about God is a God of personal love. And you see that in verses 26 through 27. Let me just read it quickly there as I'm coming to an end. He says, and he made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and more and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, 
for we are all his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we are not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devices. So again, in there we see him explaining that God's a, per, a God of personal love. He is a God of infinite love who loves everyone unconditionally. God created us, and you know this, to love him, to worship him. And God has created within our hearts, if people are truly honest, to want to know him, that desire to want to know him. You know, I heard a story. I don't remember the details exactly, but I heard this one story about this one guy who was an atheist. And he went to, actually, it was a friend who, was, who, who had atheist, atheist friends. And he talks about, he said that he went to this guy and, 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 and this guy would take the polygraph test to see whether someone is lying. And he said, man, he told his one friend, man, it's crazy because, you know, every atheist that I would take this t polygraph test on them, I would ask them if they believed in God. And he said, and did you know that all of them failed the test when they said, no, we don't believe in God? Because deep down in their heart, they know there's a God. God put that in their heart for them to want to desire God. But as they constantly keep rejecting him more and more and more, they get to a point where now they're not even thinking of God. But that's when we come, right? We come with the truth. We come with, with, with God's word, faithfully proclaiming to them that God loves them. And quickly, verse 37, we see how God... Paul talks about how God is the God of supernatural salvation. Again, in verse 31, he says, Because he has appointed a day on which he would judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. From the dead. Supernatural salvation. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, he's talking about a Savior who suffered, bled, and died on the cross, who was buried and walked out of the grave and shown, and shown to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. Paul wasn't ashamed to preach the resurrection of Christ on Mars Hill, and we shouldn't be ashamed to preach the gospel in our homes, in our schools, and so forth. And now as I close, notice verses 32 to 34. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Verse 33. So Paul departed from them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them is Dionysius, the uh, Acheropite. I don't know if I can pronounce that either. This is where I say, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God uses the foolish right here. Here you go. A woman named Damaris and others with him. So I want you to note something. With this, we need to understand this truth. When we're sharing the gospel, Expect people to listen. Expect conversions. Because the word, the gospel is powerful. And it saves souls. Someone took the time to preach the gospel to you. And you were in a time where you didn't want God. Remember that? But something happened. You listened. And God opened your heart. And you were able to receive. Listen closely as I close. Expect converts to your faith as you preach there will be those who will believe and others who will reject but as you preach expect these responses number one expect people to mock you we see that in verse 32 the question i want to ask you are you willing to be laughed at are you willing to be laughed at it's been said that some rather face a lion than ridicule are you okay with people laughing at you? Here we're talking about Paul, an intellectual man, a rabbi who was taught under Gamaliel. And he's okay with it by him being laughed at. Why? Because he knows that regardless of what they say or do, oh, they heard the gospel. Number two, expect people to put it off. Notice verse uh, 32. It says, we will hear you again on this matter. They were putting it off. So some will not mock, but some, after you share the gospel with them, they'll put it off. But I want you to know that these people that are putting it off are playing Russian roulette with their own lives. Because the more you say no, 
the harder it will be for you to say yes. Some will put it off. You can also expect number three, verse 34, like some responded, some to make the decision to follow God. So some will mock, some will put it off, but know this, there'll be those, there'll be those that will accept. And when you see that person get saved, oh man, it'll bless your heart. You're going to want to save more people. Trust me, man. Saving souls is addicting. It is. You want it, when you see them walk forward or raise their hand and you brought them, you're like, oh, yes, God, this is so cool. And, and then you want to, oh, and then, and then you're going to try to convince that person that you brought, you want to go preach the gospel with me? <laughs> yeah, okay. Now you're both pumped up. Now you're doing the work for God. So you expect those three things. But we have to stand firm because I will tell you this Paul did, and he got the opportunity to preach the gospel. Some saved. And if you were to interview Paul, he would have told you, you know what, those souls, regardless of the mockery, regardless of those putting it off, they were worth it. They were worth it. Are the people that God puts in your mind all the time worth you? Are they worth it to you? Do you want to see them saved? Then don't give up. Remain faithful. That God may use you. If not, if, if maybe just to water the plant, that's fine. But you want to be used by God in a way that will bring him glory. And to see your loved ones, friends, and so forth get saved, trust me, it will, it's going to continue to move you to do more for God.